choir sang, we want to follow you everywhere. We want to follow you wherever you lead. We want to follow you all the days of our lives. But Father, we live in a life that there are several struggles. The devil is here and with the demons and evil spirit to make sure that, Lord, we will never reach our goal. But we thank you because of the great lion of the tribe of Judah that died for us and to make sure that we can, the, we can have the power to live a life above sin, above Satan, above power, principalities, and forces in this life. And we are grateful because, Lord, by your grace, we will live for you to the glory of your name, to we see your face, to we see you face to face in Jesus' name. As we come to look into the pages of scriptures, Lord, I pray that, Lord, you open our understanding, that we'll understand the truth of your word. Teach us and give us divine revelation of the truth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to thank God very much for uh, today. The children can go to their class. Uh, today we are looking at commitment to God and the church. You can call it also faithfulness to God and the church. Amen? And I think that is what God wants and expects from each and every one of us. It's not just that we get committed to, the, to God and say we are getting committed to the Almighty. And a clear evidence that that is true is, will show in our commitment to the body of Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. Our text is taken from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, and I read from verse 17. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, I read from verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, that's talking about Paul, and called the elders of the church, verse 18, Acts chapter 20, verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews who were trying to kill him because of his consistent stand on the truth of the gospel. Verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. That Paul made sure that he told the wholesome, he taught them the wholesome gospel. He didn't teach them one doctrine of salvation, and then we'll, he will, and he failed to teach them about the severity of hell. He was not just trying to uh, pamper them, you know, by always giving them prosperity teachings and telling them how you can be a Christian and be very prosperous. But he also made it clear to them that just like we studied in our Sagi scripture for some time now, that you can be a Christian and suffer like Job. He gave them the whole wholesome picture of what Christianity is all about. It's not just about getting goodies from the Lord. It, because you are in this life. He taught them that in this life, just like Jesus said to us, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheers because I have over, I overcame the world. In verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greek, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. He was saying that, look, when I come and I saw a very rich Jew, I, I don't just because of the fact that he gives a lot to the building of the church and he's made a lot of sacrifices that I now shy off from telling him about repentance. I was bold to teach, as we see in the testifying both to the Jews and to the Greek, repentance towards God. He told them clearly that there is no second, there is no alternative way 
to seeing Christ. There's no alternative way to making heaven apart from the pathway of repentance and true and genuine repentance and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22. And now behold, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bound, bonds and afflictions abide me. But, and he said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life there unto me, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You know, this is the kind of Christian I want to be. I want to be a Paul kind of Christian. Someone who knew that there is danger ahead, but he said, look, if I can still go and win a soul, I don't care about that danger. Let me die in the process. If I can deliver somebody from hell, if I can stand before Caesar, if I can stand before these dignitaries to go and preach the gospel, and my, it might cost me losing my contract. It might cost me losing my, uh, my losing favors. But I would rather declare to them the wholesome gospel of Jesus Christ and lose whatever benefits that I might have left in this life. And that was what Paul stood for. In fact, so many people, and I tend to agree with them, that Paul is the greatest Christian that has ever lived, that, that, is, in, that is recorded in this Bible. This man, he wasn't, he wasn't faking it as a sinner. He lived a full life of a sinner. He persecuted and killed Christians. In fact, but thank God that every persecutor of Christ's people never go, never go free. You know, along the road, you either get converted or you die. You know, and it happened that the Spirit of God arrested him and thank God because when the Spirit of God convicts you as he's going to, he's convicting you now of sin, as he convicted people as it, when the testimony of last Sunday was going on, as he, you know, when you, you have two choices. You can either agree with the testimony of the word of God, with the revelation of scriptures, or you reject it. But rejecting that means you might be dead. You know, you can be so religious. You can be so much. You, they can call you a prophet, a pastor. You know, uh, they can call you all these things. But again, you can be so far away from God. You see, that's why people who stand in the sacred office of a priest, of a pastor, or shall move around, there are people that are catching cold, okay? There are people that, you know, will hold this sacred office of sanctity, you know, and yet they will mess with young ladies in the church and impregnate them and commit abortion along with them. Hmm. You know, some people don't fear God. There are sometimes when God raises a prophecy, you should be shocked to know that something is going on. But even to a deadened pastor, a deadened priest, a deadened bishop, they don't care. When the Spirit of God is trying to convict their heart, they don't care. There was, a, remember the case of uh, Balaam, right? When he was going to curse, going to meet Balak to curse Israel. You remember that story? And then I was just amazed that the donkey that he was riding on saw an angel and a full-fledged human being and a prophet could not see. You know, you can be so much carried with religious activities that you lose sensitivity when the Spirit of God, that animal will be more spiritual, conscious, and aware than you. May that never happen in your life in Jesus' name. You know, you can be so deadened and yet you hold political church office without any conscience. So this man was going and the dog and the donkey spoke because he had, he tried to dodge the sword of the angel and that led to Balaam tripling. What happened? When he tripled, he now smacked. And the donkey said, what have I done to you? 
If it was me, I would shoot her. I would be afraid. When my donkey that never spoke and cannot speak by natural creation, he now opened. What have I done to you? I've been your donkey all these years. Have I ever done what I just did? Why, why couldn't you ask me why? And the man started replying because he was angry. You know, when you're angry, you become mentally insane, temporarily. The man started speaking to his donkey. He, instead of him to say, hey, why is my donkey speaking? The reaction was, that, yes, I spank you. And I'm still going to spank you again because of what you did. And I said, this prophet has gone, he has gone, he has lost his not. You know, sometimes when God begins to show miracle, sometimes we are so insensitive to the voice of the Spirit that we don't even recognize the move of God. And rather we'll be attacking the agent that God might be using to awaken us from such a uh, spiritual slumber. You know, from such a spiritual slumber. And yet, it was because not for that man, for that donkey, the angel now opened his eyes so that he would see what the donkey saw. And the angel said to him, if not for this donkey, and if the donkey has crossed, I will have killed you. I will have killed you. And I pray that God will help you and I to be spiritually sensitive when God is speaking so that we cannot lose of, of his grace in Jesus' name. Like I said today, you know, and I apologize because I had wanted us to close as early, but at least I'm not going to speak for an hour, but I'm going to reduce it, okay? Uh, but we need to hear some bit of God's word here today. In, like I said, the uh, commitment to God and the church. Amen? Amen. Paul here dem demonstrates to us the commitment, that commitment is a key ingredient in any successful Christian leadership. You know, when I see the way people act, when I see the people, the way some people lead, I just said you're not, you're not training yourself to be a leader. You know, when I, I see workers, and we said we have workers meeting at 8, let's come and pray before the church actually starts at 9, and you become, it's nothing to you. Every day you are giving one excuse or the other. You know, and you cannot even, you don't make any kind of sacrifice. Look at the life of Paul. This is a well-educated, well-versed. But this man was very, also very, very sensitive. Please reduce my mind because of the humming. You know, but yet... <laughs> Praise the Lord. You see, let me tell us here. Commitment is taking the first step forward and then pushing through obstacles and stretching our limits to make our passion and vision a reality. When you say you are committed to a cause, it, it means taking action, taking the first step to say, okay, I'm going to do this. And then it's not just that you said it yourself. You took action to doing it. Amen? Remember the prodigal son. Without commitment, actually, and faithfulness, you can't be born again. The prodigal son, when he came to his senses, the Bible says. But what that, when he came to his senses, what actually that meant is that this, when the Spirit of God convicted him, and he realized how he has fallen from grace, the Bible says this man, now what he did was what? He said, I will go back to my father. That's uh, an action statement. But what if he said, I will go back to my father and never went? It, it would not have fulfilled commitment. But he said, you know what? I will go back to my father. And I will say to my father, please forgive me. And he did. He went forth. The Bible said, and he arose. Went back to his father. And the rest was history. See, some of us, except we take that first step, 
and make a commitment, we will never be where God wants to, want us to be in, in life. It might even be not just restricted to, to, uh, to spiritual activities. It also be our family commitment. When we, don't, when we don't want to, if we cannot commit and take an action, maybe the wife has been complaining this and that. And you know what she's saying is true. I agree with you, baby, uh, blah, 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 but you've not done anything. You haven't shown commitment. You haven't shown commitment. Commitment requires action. All right? If you said, okay, uh, my, uh, uh, honey, I will never forget your birthday. You need to take action to make sure that doesn't happen again. By either putting it on a calendar, uh, a calendar or maybe, maybe you keep forgetting to pick up the kids. You know? Commitment requires that you program it so that Allah will always be waking you, uh, be letting you know when it's time so that you take action. Praise the Lord. So, but this uh, Paul... Uh, if we say we're committed in sports, it's not just about going out to practice. It's going out the door and doing it. When you say you are committed to a marriage, it's, not, it's more than saying you will forgive one another. You actually, you forgive and you start working together. When you say you're committed to Jesus, you know, it's, it's not just believing that he's your Savior and your Lord. It is about living according to the teaching and the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ and being an example. That's what commitment is all about. You know, I, we Africans are very religious but we are not very much Christ-like. We are very, very religious. That, doesn't, that does not, is not synonymous with true Christianity. We are religious, we still take bribes. We are religious, we still, uh, we still, uh, we still uh, forge papers. We are religious, and, and it's like our commitment to Jesus Christ does it, it's not affecting our everyday life. If it does not, of what use? How are you different from the Buddhists? How are you different from the moralists, from the atheists? Commitment to Christ is about being the real Christian that you ought to be. Praise the Lord. Quickly, we are going to take a look at three points before we round up today. Number one, the direction of commitment. The direction of commitment. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 3. I read from verse 14. The first, the A part, I'm going to have, give us about five points in the direction of commitment. There are different paths of commitment. One of them is commitment to maintain, in, maintaining integrity. Second uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such, and be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without sports and blameless. Integrity is about doing something when nobody is watching. You know, it's good to have beautiful faces, preach wonderful sermon. How are you in secret? How are you if you travel to another city, stay in a hotel, and uh, you are being tempted with a co-worker, but you're married? Do you say, no? Nope. And nobody will ever know. Your wife might never know because it's outside the state, outside the country. Nobody will ever know. But God is watching. When you're on your phone and you are glued to all those things, filthy images, videos, that if somebody shows up, you, you, you quickly... Uh, manage to cover everything and uh, from these young people here, because their parents are not well versed, they will just switch off the monitor, switch off the speaker. And they, they say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just reading my book. It's a lie. You know, one sin leads to more other sins. If for the, uh, and I pray that that will not be you, but that God will give you the grace so that when one day you stand before God, you can stand boldly before him and said, and God could say, well done, welcome home, thou good and faithful servants in the name of Jesus. First is integrity. 
Integrity is a quality of state, or state of being of sound moral principle, upright, honesty, and sincerity. If you are not a man of integrity, your wife can't even trust your word. Even when you say the truth, she said it, she thinks she might be lying. If you lie, she's not sure if you are telling the truth. Integrity is about say what you mean and you mean what you say. Integrity is about when you have somebody and you have a contract, whether it is written and written or is verbal, people can hold you on your word. Praise the Lord. People can hold you on your word. And people can, can go to bank with it. Amen? There are some people, just because some men, just because of the person that is referring them, they, uh, they just accept them. They just give them the job based on whomever was referring them. When I was going to be uh, part of the Cabarrus County Sheriff Chaplain, um, I got a, a, a referral by one of the pastors in the area, very uh, big pastors and well-known. And when my referral got there, they did not interview me. They admitted me. All right? They just admitted me. Uh, the reason I, I, I said that was just we were having a meeting because I'm part of now the a, a, a team lead. I have other chaplains under me. And I, uh, we were, they were having a meeting with the team leads because they are trying to admit so much. And we are reviewing the applications and their resume and the other stuff. And I just realized nobody ever reviewed mine. I can't even remember applying like this. And that was because of integrity. There was someone that had credibility that gave me that reference. Are you that credible? Can people actually use you? You need to be committed to integrity. That your children will know it. Your children will know that, look, if I say I'm going to take this away from you, if you mess up, I'm going to take it away from you. And you do it. Because if you keep failing on those things you say you will not, and they will know you are never serious. The same way if you promise, you know, if you promise, and I learned that this late, when you promise to children, oh, we're going to the carowind this Saturday, give all your possible best to keep to your promise. Because all those things are forming your characters, the character of integrity. That commitment, when you commit something to your wife, let them know that even if something happened, the same thing with coming to church early. There are people, in fact, when I was in Brookshire, they know that, look, I don't come late to church. Even here. But if you leave a legacy, and the day you don't come, they say something must have happened. Because you have left, you've left a trail. But if you are the one that sadly there on time, uh, when you didn't come by 10, and the church starts by 9, you didn't come by 10, they say, what about you? Oh, she might still come. It's like her. You know, she's not coming late. It's not in her DNA. You know, let them not be a man and a woman of integrity. Praise the Lord. Uh, number two, on the direction of commitment. You know, on the person of integrity is willing to be open about their strengths and weaknesses. That's something I wanted to say before I move to that second sub point. When somebody is of integrity, is able to, is willing to confess. You see, we're not perfect. Sometimes we make mistakes, but an, uh, uh, a person of integrity will come and make confession to the wife, apologize to the wife. The same thing, the man of integrity will be able to admit, in fact, acknowledging your sinfulness, acknowledging your error is part of your integrity. A man, a woman of integrity is not always showing strength. You can also show weaknesses. Praise the Lord. 
That is, that's a man of integrity. Number, uh, 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 short point number two, commitment to forgive those who hurt you. You know, when you are committed and you have made up your mind, I cannot go to hell because of you. I will, nothing you will do will ever make me go to hell. If you make that commitment, that means whatever somebody does, you've already set up your mind. It's even pre-forgiving before it happens. Amen? Otherwise, if, if you don't do that, you will just be, you will never live a happy life. This one forgives you, you get upset. This one came late, you get upset. This one says something that is, is disrespectful to you. Uh, Sister Mary, are we there? She uh, says something that is dissatisfying to you, you got upset with her. How many people will you keep malice with? You will die before your time. That's why if you are in a place of leadership, ask God to make, give, put an, a buffer on you. So that any dag, anything, they just fall off. They will never come near your dwelling. Amen? You don't, if you begin to think of what they say, what they did not say, what they did, what they did not do, you will, you will thin down. You will stand before, and then you will be ministering death to people and not life. Praise the Lord. But if you have Settled it in your mind. No, nothing he does. Not even my wife. Not even my children. Absolutely. It is the people that are closest to you that will hurt you most. So if you have made up that, look, my wife, I'm willing to go to heaven. Even when, in fact, sometimes I confess even the one that I didn't commit. So that I can freely Stand before the people of God and preach the gospel of Christ freely. Amen? But when you are holding back, it's a burden. It's a load. And that load will weigh you down as you get into the ministry of commitment. Praise the Lord. So you need to be committed to forgive. Amen? In Hebrew chapter 12, verse 14, we know that very passage very well. Hebrew chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrew chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. Are we there? Hebrew, it said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Stop here. You see, the Bible is saying, follow peace with all men. So um, I remember one young girl asked me, why will God say to all men, what about women? <laughs> and I want to say here that God meant men and women. In fact, when in many passages of scriptures, when he used men, it's using humans. Okay? Follow peace with all human beings. Follow peace with all human beings. And holiness, too. When you follow them, you need to follow them with holiness. It's not because you want peace to be. And, and the people in the village are saying, okay, if you want, your brothers and, or sisters are saying, if you want peace, then you must follow us to that man uh, to do that concussion. That is not following peace. Because the Bible says, follow peace and holiness. Right? Follow peace and holiness. Just last week or two days ago, one of... Uh, Extended family member was asking me, oh, please, uh, this, I have this injury. Please, I need help before I die. <laughs> they have duped me several times. But, you know, I forgive them all the time because I know they need help. Amen? So I keep forgiving them. I keep helping them. I give and they will lie and all those things. So this time, I send them money. Okay, go treat yourself. So he came back because for, normally, formally said, I want to go to a herbalist. <laughs> so don't even call. Oh, how, how dare you call me? I said, are you sick? Go to the doctor and I will pay. So I gave them the money. He came back and said, oh, the doctor referred us to the herbalist. <laughs> <laughs> I said, really? That I, I reminded him that among the Anene, the Jidobus, the Wangus, I am only one. There are so many others. So go get someone else that will t give you money for herbalist. Count me out. And as he kept begging me, I blocked him. You know? So the thing is this. Following peace, it has to be with what? 
holiness. The fact that I love you so much as a pastor and you come to confess to me that you committed sin, you know, and because of that, pastor, I need church to help me so that I can go and take it out. Never in my life, privately or pri publicly, follow peace with all men. And then holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. If you have a desire to see God at the end, it has to be combined with peace and also with holiness. Amen? Look at what verse 15 says. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defied. If you allow bitterness to build up, it will choke your heart for God and your love for God will be choked. When you need to be committed to forgiveness, you need to forgive those that hurt you. Otherwise, you won't, you won't go far in life. Amen? Praying for someone here in Charlotte. And as we were praying, I just paused. And I said, before we just pray with you, and all these demonic uh, uh, manifestations you say are happening in your house, the Lord is telling me that there is a level of bitterness in your heart against people. And in order for, we can pray. We can fake ourselves and pray and go. But when we leave, those things will still be operating because you need to have divine power yourself. He said, Pastor, mm. hmm. I can't forgive them all. I can't forgive them. I said, what do you mean? God has forgiven you your own. Why can't you forgive? Hmm. He said, did you know what they did to me? Did you know how they destroyed my character? So What? Can anybody, could, they, could you have done, could, what we did Christ, worst thing, and yet he forgave us. What is that your husband, your wife, your sister, your in-law, anybody could have done that you cannot forgive? If you find out that you have that heart of unforgiveness, please ask God, please have mercy upon me and give me the grace so that this root of bitterness that is building up in my heart will be uprooted and I can, I can be free to forgive. It might be because during uh, a death in your family, some people didn't show up. Or the way the, some utterances some people made when they were marrying you. You are still remembering those things. And you are still holding them against them. My brother, I want you to uh, learn to forgive and the Lord will show you mercy in the name of Jesus. Commitment to be a blessing and encourager. You know, uh, that's number three. Uh, sorry. Uh, commitment to rest upon and trust in God. That's number three. Commitment to rest upon and trust in God. You have to be committed to say, Lord, no matter what life might throw on me, I'm going to hand them over to you. I'm not going to go ahead of you in life. Lord, I'm going to, I don't want to go before you. I want you to go in front and I will follow. You need to be committed to say, whatever problem I have, I'm going to cast it onto him. Praise the Lord. I remember in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. The Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. I know I've, I've told you this several times. I'm still going to share it again. The time that when I had a lot of rental properties... And one, this particular tenant who did, was owing for several months, five, four, can't remember how many months now. And then the property manager went and said, okay, eviction. And they now went before the lawyer, I mean, before the judge, and they presented fabulous, fabricated lies and pictures as evidence. Look at me now. I cannot also fake pictures. I can't tell lies in court. And the judge was so angry. How can you leave people live in this dilapidated building? By the way, judge, you should have thought, if it is that dilapidated, why are they fighting to remain there? Because we offer them to go out, but they are not willing. They want to still remain there. But the judge was so angry. If the people, the judge could have fined us 100,000 or more, the way she was so angry. 
And in fact, she ended the job by saying, okay, in fact, you will, hear, you will get a letter from me. She did not pronounce the judgment right there, but she said she was writing, she was going to send letters. When I heard the thing, I was very much troubled because I wasn't in court. I was very much troubled. I thought I could hardly eat. But I remember one time I went to the Lord and I said, Father, please, I just want you to take away this burden away from me. I don't want to even, I don't want to be pressed down, depressed, frustrated because of this thing. Miracle happens in many ways. I got up and the body was gone. Honestly, the problem is still there. But it's no longer, even if when I hear it, I don't. We just went to pray. Two weeks later, I got a letter from the court. I took the letter. I dropped it because I didn't want anything to change my mood. I, already, I thought I already knew what it would say. But because I need to scan it and send to uh, the manager to know that the letter came up, so I opened it. Ha. As I was reading, what? what? What am I hearing? What am I seeing? It happened that God worked in a miraculous way. My lawyer, what did fail to do? The judge herself and her office actually went on investigation on our behalf. Prayer, when you pray, God moves. The lawyer found out that these people that were saying that God was cut off because the, the city found out that the structure was so bad that uh, they cut off water, they cut off power, they cut off light, and they have been living in hotel, number one. These people have been so crooked, they were bypassing meters, and the city came and cut off their light. They were going to the mains to turn on the light, the water, because they haven't paid for months. And the city, after every time the city will come and turn it off, they will go, the city went there and carried the meter away. The gas, the gas company went because they had fixtures, the gas company locked it from the mains. So now, they said they were going to the hotel. They provided the receipt of the hotel they were using. It was also faked. When the people went and investigated, it was some, the last time they stayed in that hotel was a year or two before they even joined my house. So, but this is how God exonerated. You see, when we, and then they gave me the judgment. How can I evict them? The point I'm trying to make is, Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And I want to warn anybody that is hearing me, will listen and hear, and you are fighting against the people of God, a child of God, somebody who has a mark of God upon their life. Be careful, because if God remembers you, it will not be well with you. Don't fight a Christian. Reconcile with a child of God. Praise the Lord. Number four, you know, um, commitment to be a blessing and an encourager. You want to be committed to say, Lord, in my life, I want to be a blessing to people. I want to be an encourager to people. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19. In Romans chapter 14, verse 19. The Bible says, Let us therefore follow after this thing which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. The Bible, be committed to, a, to being a blessing. Be a blessing to someone. What is the value of your life? When all that you are, everything is all about you. Me, I, you know, and I, it's me and myself. That is selfish, self-centered lifestyle. At the end of this life, you know, you ask yourself, what have I done for others? How, how have I been a blessing? How have I been a blessing to others around me? Those people around you, number one, might be your parents. Am I, have I done my best for her, for her, for my dad, for my mom? Have I done the best for my brothers, for my sisters? Have I done my best for my children? Have I done my best to the people around me, have I made enough impact that if I should, what would be my regret if 
I'm taking out of life today. What will you, when you go to heaven, for example, what will you be regretting that if you were given another opportunity, you could do, you can come down to do to correct something? What will that thing that you can, what would that thing be that you can correct? This is an opportunity for you to begin to say, Lord, I want to be a channel of blessing today. I want to be a challenge, uh, a channel of blessing to someone in my life, in this church here. Who have you been a blessing to? Ebuka, are we there? Yes. Whom have you been a blessing to? Whom have you been a blessing to? Uh, have, you, have you looked around? And, and I said, oh, that sister, uh, I, uh, she's, uh, she's looking for accommodation. I can be a blessing to her. This sister, uh, this sister, she's pregnant. I think she might need assistance. I might get closer to her and see what, how I can be a blessing. I, my, the, uh, uh, when I was talking to this man, he or this sister, she told me how the son was struggling in mathematics, in science. I think I can, uh, I can, I can be of an assistant to them. You know, what? How can you be a blessing? You know, you've been in a church for a while. How can you? How are you a blessing to the body of Christ? Are you a blessing? Are you an encourager to the leadership to the church? Will the pastor give a good testimony of you that you have been a blessing to him? Will the pastor give a testimony that your, your attendance, your fellowship in the church, you have been an encourager to the, to the pastor, to the pastorate, to the body of Christ? What will be the testimony of the pastor and of the people of God concerning you? When you leave, so when you leave will they miss you? Or would they say, oh God, thank God for such a deliverance? You know? Uh, thank God for such a deliverance. I mean, uh, that, that uh, one that criticizes everything that is done in the church, that, that thing that criticizes everything that a pastor does, uh, is, uh, uh, that criticizes every time a sister preaches, that never sees anything good, thank God is, God has delivered us from him. You know, what will they think about you? When our beloved brother, uh, Roger, uh, left, he has testimonies. Sisters we are talking about, that amazing Amer African-American we had for years, that God blessed us in, a, in this church with, you know, that has gone to be with the Lord now. That even some days, and I notice him, after Tuesday Bible studies, he will be in the parking lot, waiting until every sister leaves before he moves his car. That man, when you talk about punctuality in every day, and that is, this is pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, when we, our every services is on site. That man will never be late. Come from downtown Charlotte, but he will never be late. You know, and it's, it's someone that I missed, you know, because of his dedication and his commitment to Christian service. Be a blessing, be a blessing. People dis get discouraged in life. You need to be a source of encouragement to them. Look at what we studied during the side of the scriptures this morning. Job, look at what his friend, look at what they became. They became as people, the Bible said they were miserable comforters. They were comforting, but their comfort is, is, is miserable. It was, it was better they never came then they came and they were adding sorrow and injury to that man. I pray that will not be you, but you will be a plus and not a minus in anybody's life in Jesus' name. If you cannot be a plus, just get out. Get out. Don't be a minus. Be a zero, and God will help us in Jesus' name. Number four, number five, commitment to being a peacemaker. I think we've made mention of that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, you, you see people that, uh, a brother and a sister, that are uh, a, a family that is not getting, be, be a plus in that family. Be a peacemaker. Be in to settle it. Don't worsen the problem. Better the problem. If a wife confides in you, in what, and this is not for public co uh, consumption, a wife confides in you as a, uh, a pastor's wife, you know, 
and wanted you tells you what the husband is doing and what is it's not for you to be telling others and then be making caricature of that man. It is for you to, in the bond of peace, amen, to come and make sure that you can, things can be united. Amen? And I thank God for this church. A lot of the things, even the next, will not even hear a lot of the thing that is going on until someone else, but not true, you know, and I pray that you'll be committed to peace. You can walk hand in hand without seeing eye to eye on every issue. That's true, even in, in church matters, all right? Um, but God will not bless a divided home, a divided family, a divided nation, or a divided church. Let me tell you, um, Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Christ was rebooking the, um, uh, Jesus Christ was rebooking the Pharisees. They said, look, you think that I'm doing this uh, by the powers of baseball, by the powers of devil. A, and I'm walking, how can I be walking for the devil and I'm yet destroying the works of the devil? That's a kingdom that is fighting against itself will never stand. Praise the Lord. But Jesus Christ, amen, is on a different, was on a, a different pedestal than all those put together. And that's why he can cast devil, because he's none of them. Amen? And I trust that God will help us in our various homes, with that we need to be committed to peace. You know, a, a husband that is committed to peace will be able to say, and forget the fact that I'm the head of the family. If when you have been, when you wrong, be, be ready to say I'm sorry, right? And the wife, you see, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I think I'm gonna shout everyone to, to weakness, you know? But you see, the thing is, when a woman recognizes her responsibilities and office in the house of the Lord, there will be peace. You remember that a man needs honor. Honor your man. He will love you. And a man, if you know your wife, pamper her. I've never seen a woman that is heavily pampered that doesn't honor the wife. I mean, the husband. You know, your wife is lying down. You are massaging her legs and massaging her back. She will remember that little action. She will remember. He will call you names. She will recreate names for you. She will regenerate names for you. Eh? Honey boo boo. You know? She will call you names that you've never heard of. That, you see? And that's one thing that love does. Love causes people to be creative. You know? Love causes people to, be, to, to get out of that shelf to be what they cannot. You know? It is that thing that when the wife begins to cause her husband and honor her with, the man becomes crazy for the wife. We go and buy legs of us, legs of us for the woman. Meanwhile, the man has won. I will never buy a car less than 10,000, more than 10,000. That will be, and I will never buy a brand new car. But when the wife triggers the medulla oblongata with love, the man loses his sense, his senses. Goes and buy a car worth of $40,000, you know, and takes the mortgage or takes the thing for the wife. Love will make you wrong, do crazy things. Praise the Lord. Finally, before, I'm not going to point number two and number three because of our time. We already overshot what I had planned. I apologize. But I'm going to just, this first point is where I'm going to end up today. Maybe next time we're going to continue from the second point. But the final one is commitment to continue to grow, increase, and develop. My brothers, when you stagnate in life, you are not committed. Whether in the things of God, whether in the things of the, uh, your professional life or your family life, you have to grow and you have to increase. You have to develop yourself. Otherwise, you are not committed. You have to be committed to these things. You need to be committed to growth. Praise the Lord. In order to be the best that you can. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 
2 Peter chapter 1, I read from verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, I read from verse 5. And beside this, giving diligence add to your faith virtue. So you have faith. I want you to increase and add virtue unto it. Okay, now, add to your faith virtue and to your virtue add what? Knowledge. Verse 6. And to knowledge add temperance. That's another level of growth. And then to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, charity. For if this thing be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Learning, brethren, is the lifestyle of the Christian leaders. You want to amount to something, someone great in the, in the things of God, in the house of God, then you have to be, you have to grow. You have to grow in the things of God. The moment you think you know it all, I don't need to improve my prayer life. I don't need to improve the study of God's life, uh, of the word of God. You have stag a stagnant Christian is a backslider. Did you hear what I just said? If you have stagnated and you cannot even pray for 30 minutes, you say you've been a Christian for uh, 30 years, 20 years, uh, 10 years, 5 years, and you can't even pray for 15 minutes. The longest prayer you pray is the prayer you pray when you are eating food. It's sharing grace. The, may the grace of, that's the longest. You wake up in the morning, you hurry up, and maybe you jump into the car, God, please direct my path this day. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't have time for you to pray, but uh, you, you know what, he, you, uh, you understand. You know, you understand, share, and then you say, help me in Jesus' name. That's all you do. Listen. How do you, if everybody was your kind, your level of Christianity, how would the church of God grow? If everybody no, is as good, as lethargic as you are in the body of Christ, where you might you say that. One of the things I tell my children, it is not enough to be morally okay. The evidence of clear Christianity if you are born again to others is exploits. You cannot be a virtual man all the time and you've been coming to church for five, ten years. And you're still like that. You don't want to sacrifice your time to come in the choir. You don't want to uh, spend time to clean the bathrooms. Or you, you don't just, you want to come on Sundays alone. And you don't want any responsibility. How committed are you to Jesus? How committed are you to God and the church of God and his body? How committed are you as a Christian? How are you, how committed are you to grow? Did you know that in order for the baton to be handed from Moses to Joshua, Joshua has to stay closer to Moses, closer to the anointing. And Joshua had to be following him. He had to live from, from the crowd, from the rest of the crowd. And he was going to the mountain for 40 days. It, God did not tell them how long he's going to stay there. As Moses was going, Joshua followed him. In fact, as I was reading that place, I was thinking, Moses and Joshua, they didn't make provision for 40 days of food, of what to eat. I agreed that Moses, when he got into the cl cloud of glory to meet the, with the Lord in the mountain, the anointing and the oral of the presence of God covered him, and that quenched away hunger. I agreed. What about the one at the foot of the mountain, Joshua? Did he make provision for 40 days' food? He did not. But that man stood there. That man was committed to God and to the work of God, to the servant of God, to the people of God, and he was standing there. And he never left. You see, when you desire an, a higher office for God, you need to prove that you are worthy of the baton to be handed over to you. You need to decide that, Father, all these flimsy excuses that I give, Whenever they are looking for people in the choir, people that are going to the prayer team, people that will come and pray on Saturday morning with the women, people that will come on, 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 on Wednesdays or Mondays to pray with the women and with the men. When, Lord, 
I want to repent from today on. Those laxity, those uh, those carelessness, those carefree attitude. I've already become the Sunday Sunday Christian. I don't come to Bible studies, even though I, I can join. I, I do join from Zoom because our Bible studies are on Zoom. Our Thursday revival hours is on Zoom, and yet you only come on Sundays. What's your excuse? I pray that God will help you so that you can be a committed Christian in the name of Jesus. Let's rise up and I want you to talk to the Lord. I want you to talk to the Lord and say, Father, please help me. Ancient of this, please, I am yours and I want to be yours. Give me the grace to be whom you want me to be. I want you to help me, Heavenly Father, so that, Lord, I will be yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Begin to talk to the Lord. Begin to talk to the Lord. Begin to talk to the ancient of days. Begin to talk to the one in whom we have to do. He is God and there is none like unto him. Ask God and say, Father, please, I want to be committed to maintaining integrity. There is a single lady. I will not, I will not compromise my morality because of a temporary pleasure. I want to commit it, whether God is hearing or not, to say the truth and not lie all the time. I want to be committed to sincerity and to fairness. I want to be committed to honesty. Heavenly Father, I want to be a man, a woman of integrity. Help me, Lord, that I will be committed to forgiveness, to letting things go, to trusting you. I want to be committed to trusting you every day of my life and not carry my body to myself. I want to be committed to be a blessing and an encourager. I want to be committed to being a peacemaker. I want to be committed to growth. I want to read Christian books. I want to study more of your word. I want to pray. I want to pray more. I want to develop myself in the area of seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, these are things, provision that you have made for the body of Christ, for the children of God. Father, help me, O oh God, so that I can be that which you have for your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Pastor Victor, please. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Just type in. Got songs? Type in. Type in the grace.